Angelo, such a pleasure to have you on. How are you today? Doing very well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, you're so very welcome. I myself am getting over COVID. So this is a very good, good experience to have <laughs> coming out of that. So I'm mm. thrilled to have you on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. So how did this all begin for you? Your book is absolutely wonderful. But how did your awakening process begin? Well, the 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 whole process really was rooted in personal suffering. So um, when I was growing up, probably, well, even in childhood, I was, I was very sensitive and, you know, I didn't know this as such, but I was sensitive to everything around me, the energies of people, the emotions of people around me and so forth. And um, I remember as a very young child feeling, feeling that presence of childhood, but I also remember like the emotional landscapes of other people starting to close in. And I was able to sort of um, accommodate it, I think, because you know a child's mind and heart is pretty open. So, I, but I felt a lot of it. I could feel a lot of heaviness in people around me, and I was quite aware it was other people's emotional, like um, uh, inner worlds that I was feeling. Now, again, I didn't know that like in words, but I felt it. Uh, and then as the, the identity, the internal identity started to formulate itself, as I grew into like older childhood, and then definitely during adolescent years, it became very, very intense internally, this, this experience of being sort of stuck in a mind, stuck in a, an inner world, um, being bombarded by thoughts and feel and feeling more and more bound to thoughts as if I was defined by thoughts. And I don't know when or exactly how that started happening, but I remember finding myself in that. And even even probably like mid childhood years, I remember times being quite aware that all of a sudden there were a lot of thoughts and I didn't know where they were coming from, but they felt very binding. They felt mm -hmm. sticky and I knew it was happening and I didn't know why it was happening. Interestingly, I, um, I, I don't know if, if it was just the way my family was, but there was something in me. My instinct was not to talk about it or not to ask about it. Mm -hmm. And as I got older and I, I really learned, I think, how people are, how they how they relate and largely and authentically, I think I my instinct was reinforced that this isn't really something to talk about. It kind of it almost scares people to talk about this somehow. I didn't know why that was exactly, mm -hmm. but I knew there was an issue, a problem with internal struggle with thought. And it just became kind of like a pressure cooker for me. It was really, really uncomfortable to be me, to be alive in a body and a mind by the time I was mid-teens. And early 20s was pretty brutal. Now, I learned to meditate when I was 19, and that helped. It helped soothe the 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 sting of that, but really only while I was meditating. It didn't, didn't really carry it throughout the day, and the underlying quote-unquote problem was still there for sure. And it just felt very, very intense and heavy in my mind. So I just did my best and tried to get along with the ways – you know, people talk about getting along and being happy as a human. So I, I went along with the, the program, the social program as best I could, but something in me instinctually knew this is not it. This cannot be like, are we really just here to suffer because I'm suffering? I wasn't mm -hmm. sure how much other people were suffering. I knew some were, and I could also see in, in the world, there were areas and places and situations where there was tremendous amounts of suffering. I knew that. And so I was like, well, what the hell are we doing? You know, why isn't anyone talking about this? That kind of thing. Wow. So that's mm -hmm. what led me. That's what led me and set up the conditions for me to um, start to want to wake up. Uh, and then I can talk if you want me to about this more specifically when it dawned on me what that even meant and that it was possible as an actuality. Of course. And I just want to ask you one question in reference to meditation. As you stated, it was impactful for you, maybe not throughout the day, but when at the moment you've done it. For myself, it was the same as you described it, so impactful for myself. Mm -hmm. As you stated about feeling that there's something more, just something there, I went through that. And mm -hmm. yes, you can keep going on that, please. Yeah, yeah. And um. I think, you know, of all the things I had learned or learned to do or different habits or anything in my life, meditation was definitely the one thing I think I learned when I was about 19. That was the one thing that stood out, aside from maybe reading a passage here or there in some old philosophy or something that kind of resonated. But 
other than that, the meditation was the one thing I ever learned to do that stood out in the sense that it it seemed to address things at a deeper level than than most people were talking about than the emo- than the you know, the thoughts and emotions that were so much struggle for me. Mm-hmm. This somehow got deeper than that, but I didn't know how. And it, it didn't cause a fundamental change, but I liked it and it was enjoyable. And it did a couple of times. I did have these sort of pre tastes of awakening where all of a sudden, like everything kind of changed around me and it was uncaused. There was no real reason. I didn't think my way into it. All of a sudden the mind was even kind of quiet and things were in flow and very peaceful. And what you might call a spiritual experience or a mystical experience. I definitely had a couple of those events that would last a couple of days, even as I was meditating over that period of years. But the the act the the possibility that there was something to to radically address the problem of my own suffering, and I'll broaden that now to human suffering because I know it's available to anybody now. Um, but the the first inkling I I can remember that I really it clicked for me that there was something beyond this for sure, uh, and it was a possibility in me, and I I there was a way I could actually access it directly with no tools, no drugs, no meditation, nothing. It was there. Mm-hmm. Was a, actually a, a lecture in a, I wrote about this in the book, but I'll briefly talk about it. It was in a class in undergrad. I have, was doing a philosophy undergrad and uh, there was a, a professor one day. It was like a Japanese culture and Zen class or something. And there was a professor uh, who was a substitute one day because our professor was sick. And he wasn't really a professor. He was kind of like a, I think he was a monk. He might've been a monk. And, but he was a member of some local Zen center or something like that, or Buddhist center or temple. I don't remember his lineage or tradition, but I remember him very well. And he was just giving this lecture on Buddhism. And I had heard lectures on Buddhism before. He's talking about, here's the things that make you suffer. Here's the noble truths. And all of a sudden, it just totally clicked what he was talking about, that this thing can happen and this shift can happen. And he wasn't talking about it in terms of Oh yeah, if you meditate um, and do all the right things and follow the eightfold noble path for seven lifetimes, you'll be enlightened. You know that's the mental way I had I had heard it and I put it together in my mind. That's not what he was talking about. He was like pointing to something right now, and I and I, I remember like raising my hand, interrupting him. I was like, "That thing you're talking about right now is that possible? Does that actually mm-hmm. happen? Can that happen?" And he 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 it was so cool because he I remember <laughs> very clearly he stopped and he took a couple steps forward. He looked me right in the eyes and he he paused and he said there is no doubt. Mm. And he, he went back to talking. It was like the whole class, the whole lecture was one thing. And that one snippet in that conversation was a totally different thing that happened there. And it was by far more important to me at least. And that I knew I felt it like I get it, like it literally changed the quality of the, the environment. I felt it deeply. And right then I knew, Oh, there is, there's something I can do here. There's a way through this, through this suffering. What the hell? Like no one had ever said that to me. Even, and I could kind of see why even reading about Buddhism and stuff, you still can, it's still obscured somehow. Mm -hmm. It's easy to turn that into more mental stuff. And I was like, oh, this isn't more of the same. Whoa. And I felt it. I felt the ground shake (laughs) underneath me a little bit. (laughs) And uh, I remember like that had an effect on me for for a little while after. And then I, very strangely, I just kind of forgot about it. I was like, Mm -hmm. "Eh, whatever. Okay. Because, you know, the thoughts come clouding back in and Mm -hmm. you just move on about your life. But it definitely planted the seed. And I think something something deep inside, something underneath all of those ego structures and stuff was definitely the talk. The clock was ticking. You know, he had definitely planted a little seed in there. <laughs> and that was maybe, I, I don't know, it might have been, it was within a year or two before the actual awakening. Um, and that, that was the first time something really opened. And then um, fast forward to when I was 24 years old, I'll, I'll briefly summarize this because and you can ask any anything about it to clarify if you want but of i've course. said it many times but um and every time i say it it's a little different too because <laughs> i re- i remember different things about it and energetically it feels different but um it was definitely the most seminal event of my entire life and it was something that went they went and does go still does go beyond the human dimension it's just not it's it's some i'm going to talk about something that's just not of even of this world in some sense And yet it doesn't exclude this world. It's not out in outer space. But um, uh, so what happened was a a conglomeration or a a uh, coalescence of a few different events. One of them was like a breakup with a romantic partner. Um, And 
there was a, a, it was a perfect like rug pull with that because there was something about this person and me and the expectations and how bad it went, even though the expectations were so high, like, oh, this is the kind of perfect person I thought I always wanted. And then it just, you know, went to shit real quick and stuff. <laughs> and it was fine. Um, but, but it was at that age, it was perfect because it was like, oh man, that's what I was really holding out hope for that perfect person out there. Right. And so many people do this mm-hmm. and, and it was just, I could see so clearly like, that's not it. That's not going to do it. It doesn't matter how perfect that person seems. That is not the answer. And I knew a lot of other things weren't the answer, thinking and strategizing and all, all of it, you know, they have relative value. Sure. All the, all the strategies in life have relative value, but this, this was a very fundamental, um, rug pull emotionally for me. And when the emotion body kind of fell over, like it just lost its footing in a sense, things just started looking different. It was like, wow, there was like a hopelessness, but at the same time, that feeling I had when that professor or that monk kind of looked in the eyes and said that had that same feeling of like, oh, but things just thinned out. Like the sense of me being stuck as a me, trying to be a me and be who I think I am. I don't even know who the hell I am. Like all of a sudden that was just really not there so much and things looked different. So it was very, it was a very juxtaposed experience of paradoxical of like a, a true hopelessness and a major letdown um, and a lot of emotional like grief and stuff that goes with that loss of or sadness or whatever and at the very same time like there was a, there was definitely an openness and a peace that i never felt mm-hmm. but i didn't but it but i but i knew it was like not it still felt like it was at the periphery that's the mm-hmm. best way i can say it that it was something i had to investigate and i had to do it now and that was it and and i was like i didn't know what it was going to be like or what form that was going to take and it was very strange i picked up this book called the three pillars of zen and i had you know, learned some about Buddhism here and there, but I never read in depth on any of this stuff. Someone had bought this for me uh, for Christmas a couple of years before, or I got it in a class. I can't remember. And I just never even read it, but I know I'd never read the book at all. And I picked it up. I don't know how I knew to do this. There wasn't the internet back then. I wasn't online looking at non-duality videos or anything. I was just, I just grabbed this book off the bookshelf. I wasn't even reading much back then. And I opened it to this chapter that said enlightenment accounts. And Mm. these are people who went through what's called Kensho or awakening, very, very fundamental transformation and experience of everything. Uh, and they wrote about what it was like to go through it before, during, and after in their own words. And this, these, these had been written back in the sixties and these were householders. Uh, mostly, I think a couple of them were monastic like monks, but these were people who were Zen practitioners from, from the West and from Japan who went through this experience and they wrote about it. And it was so powerful. I was like, what? what? Again, why have I never heard this? But at that point, I didn't care why I'd never heard it. All I knew was I'm going I'm going to do what they did. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I don't care if this physically kills me. I don't mm-hmm. care. I did, it didn't matter. Like the stuff, I'm not here to suffer. And I, I looked at what they did. I read it. I felt it. I digested it. I meditated. I dropped deep, deep, deep in meditation. And I tried to put together the best I could out of reading this book and these exchanges with the Zen teacher of people approaching this and going through it. And I figured it out. I figured out how to do it. Angela, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm just shaking when you're just describing it because I feel for myself, I went through the same thing. Uh And it's just like, you're speaking on it and I'm just shaking because I'm going, I know, I know how that feels. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and that, that was the, that was the immediate setup for it. That was the conditions Mm. set up for the actual thing that it couldn't even call an event, but so then, then anyone listening might want to go, well, what the hell happened? Well, there's no words I can use to tell you what happened. And it, it didn't happen back then. It's still here, whatever happened. Mm-hmm. Um, it fundamentally changed the way I experience everything, truly. Myself, the external world, thoughts, emotions, being, form, all of it. It just changed everything. And, um, and, that, and, and the first part of that kind of happened in a couple of different parts. But the very first part of that was during meditation. And, um, I noticed, I was noticing the nature of thoughts and I had noticed thoughts before, but somehow I noticed like the more subtle thoughts, the ones that are kind of monitoring how you're doing in any given moment. Oh, I'm here. Oh, I'm doing okay now. Oh, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling worse. How am I feeling? What's going on? Where am I? Who am all that? Like sense of trying to keep orienting to the thought self. I was like, oh, those are more thoughts. And I would just just sort of discount that. Oh, that's a thought. Well, what else is here? And then the more and more that feeling that was in the periphery, that, that openness, that spaciousness, whatever, it's not, there's no word for it. It became more and more prominent until it wasn't in the periphery. It was 
I was like, oh my God, like that, that's what I am or that's what this is. And even that was a thought. And I, when I let go of that thought, it was just like a something turned in a way it's like mm -hmm. something turned off the sense of trying to be a me that's small and stuck inside. And it just was gone. And then there was just expansiveness, just this, like this, this vastness is the best way I can say it. Um, I, I would call that unbound consciousness in, in the way I speak now, but it was the most amazing thing. And I was like, Oh my God. And, it, and a couple of very strange things about it. One was, it was obvious. I didn't get that from somewhere else. I didn't mm -hmm. get it. Buddha didn't transmit it from, from 2000 years ago <laughs> to me. Suddenly it didn't come from outer space. I didn't figure something out. That's logical. Nothing like that. I'd saw that it was already there. It's already here. And that really twists people's mind up. And it can be very frustrating to hear, but I, I always have to reiterate that because we have so much doubt that when we hear this message, we think, Oh God, I'd like to have what he has. You have it. It's there already. Mm -hmm but you have to be authentic with whether or not you're accessing it and, mm -hmm. and whether or not you're grabbing onto thoughts and, and not going through that fear barrier. So there was a sort of fear barrier with this as I was disentangling myself thought after thought and just feeling more and more of that spaciousness, the depth, the openness, the, I don't even know whatness with no need to even label it anymore. It was just so beautiful. Um, there, there did come this like fear barrier. Um, and it's not uncommon. Your body will feel a fear because it kind of interprets a certain, a certain kind of death. Um, or threat or something because you're disidentifying from mm -hmm. thoughts. And when identity is threatened, the body will just interpret it as an actual threat. It's not, but it will feel like it physically. So I did kind of go through that, but it subsided quite quickly um, because I'd had something like it before. And I think I was sort of prepared for it. But after that, it just got extremely quiet. That's the best way I can say it. But the peace was there, the sense of this is always like this. It's never not been like this. It never couldn't be like this. You can't leave this. You've never been apart from this. It was like a beautiful, the warmest infinite hug in the world. You didn't have to, I didn't have to label it anything. God, self, no, it didn't matter. Those were all terms and phrases and thoughts. This was just purity. It was beautiful. Um, and I, when I dropped into that, I guess you could say, or dropped out of what I thought I was, and there was just that, I, I, said, I remember saying to myself, I will just do this the rest of my life. I, you know, I'll go to work, I'll do what I have to do, but anytime I can, any, I'll sit and meditate. I'll sit because this isn't meditation. This isn't a technique. It's just here. And I was, I was sure of it. I was positive. I'm like, Oh, I, I figured this thing out. <laughs> this is, I, so I sorted it out. I haven't figured all the relative stuff out. There's going to be problems, but I figured out the problem of happiness, of bliss, of consciousness, of, of being okay. Essentially just being okay with who you are in a very deep, fundamental, undeniable way that I solved. And, and that was like, cool. That was the first part of the awakening. And I would call that a definitely an awakening in the way I define it now. So, yeah. Yeah. With, with awakening, would you say at a certain point, I know of the dark night of the soul, did you feel mm -hmm. like you had to go through that shift to find that awakening? Yeah. The dark night of the soul is a very real phenomenon. Um, and it's a dramatic statement or way of saying it, but it's a pretty intense thing. And it does tend to, I wouldn't say it tends to, I think it's pretty ubiquitous. People going through this process will encounter it at various times. I'm, I, to be honest, I felt like a lot of my life before awakening was kind of like one long dark night. It was, pre <laughs> it, was it was pretty bad. Like I'll I didn't raise realize my hand how on much I was suffering. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I was suffering until the, the weight was lifted and you can relate mm -hmm. to that. Um, but, but I will say that it's pretty typical that after this shift, there's a, there's a sort of honeymoon period where things are truly in flow and just extremely peaceful and, you, there's no worries. There's no care. You know, everything's just, just lo lovely. And, um, that lasts like quite a while. And for me, it lasted like months. I don't know how long. And, um, uh, and then, uh, there's, there's, I can say, I'll just put it in a simple way. Basically you realize, realize consciousness, which is just, you are con everything is consciousness. And out of that realization, um, or with that realization, there's a tremendous capacity now to actually finally address the repressed material that kept us mind identified in the first place, even though we didn't choose any of that. It's sort of programmed into human consciousness. Now it's like, you know, pain body or whatever. Um, so, so then, yeah, that after that honeymoon period, uh, there, there tends to be a lot of emotional repressed, emotional material resistance patterns and reactivity that comes to the surface. You've, you've opened up this spaciousness of consciousness. And so, you know, it makes sense to, to actually that it's going to happen naturally. And it does happen naturally. 
it doesn't always feel comfortable. And sometimes it feels very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can feel so uncomfortable and so surprising that you might call it the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that really makes the dark night of the soul a, a lot less dark, honestly, is just knowing it's okay. It's supposed to go this way. You didn't lose your awakening. Bliss consciousness is still there. <laughs> There's just more work to do. And, and knowing it's okay, it's par for the course. The people who really, really, I, I feel so much for and get into bad places is they have an awakening like this and they really don't have any context at all. They have no spiritual understanding background. They really don't know what it is. And then they don't get good help from the outside and they don't have any support. And then some of them even go to like an emergency department. I've met people who've gotten admitted for inpatient psychiatric treatment because they didn't realize what was happening, you know, um, which is really unfortunate. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, 70% of the struggle around dark night stuff and repressed material and all that is just knowing this is how it goes. It's okay. It won't last forever. There's a finite amount of resistant there's a finite amount of reactivity i'll say that in the individual and i was just about to say that with the like everyone thinks oh spiritual awakening rainbows and sunshine but you go through this uncomfortable period and oh, yeah. i was just about to say that yeah it's not all that <laughs> butterflies and stuff like that it's work yeah. it's it's work yeah. and um there there are some good really good teachers out there but adya shanti is one of my favorite mm -hmm. teachers all all across the board and he speaks at all different levels and he's great in the emotion spectrum and the spirit spectrum and the he's just really good but one of the things he says and i think it's very true is the first part of awakening the first part of the process is up and out it's it's expansive it's it's um transcendent for sure the, but but then the second part is down and in it's redemptive love and that's the part where we yeah there's a there's quite a spectrum of how people deal with that. The people I see suffer the most here are the ones that really resist this. It's just not a good idea mm -hmm. because now there's no you don't have filters anymore. You don't you can't avoid stuff anymore. It's so much harder to do it. It requires so much more energy and it's so much more disorienting. So, you know, but on the other end of the spectrum, there are people that for whatever reason, a lot of them have done a lot of emotion work ahead of time and stuff, but they they just don't resist it and they're just okay with it. And they do really well. Like they move through it pretty pretty well but it there's still going to be you're going to go through all the stuff you're going to go through the shame you're going to go through the resentment fear you know grief like those emotions are there they're human emotions they've been repressed for thousands of years so we're going to have some contact with them and they turn out to be perfectly okay actually it's it's the resistance and avoidance and habituated um reactivity that causes us suffering essentially and struggle awakening and being liberated can mm -hmm. you share the difference as you spoke upon in your book? Yeah, for sure. So when I say the term awake, not everyone uses the terminology the same way, by the way. So it's important to ask these questions and anyone who's listening, everything, everything I do, I try to gauge towards the listener. So anyone who's listening, anyone you work with, any teacher, anything, um, just put those questions to them. Ask, make sure you, they know what they're talking about. If you don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> they damn well better know what they're talking about and should be able to relate it. So it's really important to ask these questions, actually. What do you mean by awakening? What do you mean by Ken show? What do you mean by liberation, enlightenment? So when I talk about awakening, um, I usually mean that first significant shift. Ken show is the Zen term for it. Satori is another Zen term, maybe a little more widely known. It's It's a fundamental shift just as i described it's it, it it's a shift completely out of any paradigm it has nothing to do with thought or concept in this in, in fact it's it's actually waking up from the the identity around thoughts and concepts and realizing the infinite nature of consciousness um that it would be awakening first awakening those are the terms i usually use beyond that you you have the shadow work, um, the dark night of the soul type stuff. And that can go on for a few a good few years for sure. And sometimes longer if, if you if you don't know what's going on and you're avoiding it and not realizing it. Um, you can definitely drag on, but that's gonna last, it doesn't happen immediately, liberation, right? So once you work through a lot of that, and there are many ways to work through it, you know, many ways. There's therapy, there's uh physical modalities, there's remyelinating the the vagus nerve. There's all these things we can do. But a lot of it has to do with inquiry. What am I actually feeling? What what do I believe about my feelings? What do I believe about what's going on in the in, in my partner and my boss? And like just actually seeing what's happening, clear seeing is a big part of it. And then in a, in about feeling, being willing to literally just feel what's happening in the body, and getting into that more and more to that direct experience. That's a lot of shadow work. Now, once you've gotten through a lot of that, um, you can really start to work on 
the fundamentals of reactivity. And the fundamentals of reactivity are simply stated, this is the way the world is, or my world, or my view right now. This is the set of circumstances that are occurring. And inside, there's a, I have this template that says, and here's how it should be. <laughs> and you have to see that that's a fool's game. You will never win the game. You just can't win that game. Now, again, this isn't something that's easily approached until after awakening because it's very easy to get up in the head about it and go, well, the world has problems. Shouldn't we care about that and all this? That's not really what I'm talking about. It's more of a, it's an internal experience and a direct reaction to what's happening. And what you see, and there's very specific ways to approach this. I have a whole playlist on it, the equanimity playlist. There are ways to directly look into where a physical sensation and, um, and the sort of mind's snapshot of the moment of what's happening, where that turns into, even if it's un uncomfortable, where does that turn into a reaction? Where does that turn into distraction, addictions, habits, uh, shopping, uh, porn, uh, drugs, alcohol, arguments, obsessive relationship, dynamic drama, uh, obsessive working out, eating, like all the things we do, right? Those are reactions. And we are, after awakening, one of the things that can be really hard to see is that we're a bundle of reactions. <laughs> Largely, what we take ourselves to be is a bundle of reactions. But the beauty of awakening is it scrapes away that top layer of identity so you can actually get down and see the mechanics of what is making you feel like you. And it can be kind of daunting when you realize a lot of what makes you feel like you is actually reactivity. But by looking at it and mostly just looking at it, being willing to just go there into that, that sort of discomfort, that gap between what is and what I want to be, that calms a lot of it passively just by going there and staying there and be willing to, to experience what's there. Uh, and then really seeing, is there any necessity for a reaction at all? Is there anything that's here that's actually reacting? And at some point that can completely subside. It can completely subside where the reactivity is just gone. It's uh, you can respond to things just fine. You can, you can, you can be dynamic. You can move, you can work all that. You don't become reticent or uh, hesitant in life. You don't, you don't become avoidant quite the opposite. Often avoidance, hesitancy, disassociation are actually based in a sort of constant latent reactivity, but it's an internal reactivity. So reactivity of avoidance in life, all that clears away. And this, this is what I would call equanimity. To put it in a Buddhist context, you could call it when the fourth and fifth fetters are dissolved or broken. Um, desire and ill will, they're called. But I find that the, the first movement of that is really avoidance. It's, it's aversion. And desire is a result of aversion. We, the desires of the mind, that by the time we're desiring something, we're already in a reaction. Um, so the aversion, the, it's essentially the fear of life, the fear of this moment, just as it is. That's what we're really addressing with this, this movement. Um, once the body-mind is, is calm and, and the equanimity is realized, um, it doesn't have to go in this order, by the way, but it, it works well in this order. And here's the reason. Um, once that's clarified, it's, it's, very, it's much easier to see the really fundamental layers of um, uh, filtering that are occurring. They, I would say they're thought because they are a sort of form of thought, but they're not narrative thought. They're not gross thought. They're not image thoughts. They are a literal overlay that makes the world appear dualistic. So now we're getting into like the deep end of the pool mm -hmm. and what I might call non-duality. Um, but it's a very specific perceptual filter that falls. Now it's interesting because many people with the first awakening do experience some degree of non-duality, non-duality in their actual physical world, like non-separation, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, it's just completely at bay and they don't, they don't experience it until later on. Um, once you start to investigate this, and there are specific ways to do this as well, except experiencing, um, not experiencing, uh, investigating the experience of there being a subject here and an object out there, w being in a world of objects, being in a three-dimensional world, actually investigating and seeing, well, where am I taking my cues from that? Do I see anything in the visual field that actually says that's the case? Or is the thought, am I bouncing back into the mind and, and putting a thought overlay saying that's out there and I'm in here? Um, and that uh, can can subside all at once. It does, I've seen it happen all the different ways. It can subside all at once for someone like, like that, like a snap of a finger is just gone. Um, it can happen early, it can happen later. And for some people, it's intermittent for a while, 
where it's like hazy and then it just clicks. Um, it's not a big deal. It's interesting. This is this is whereas like reactivity and equanimity are more very much on the personal spectrum. They feel like very much me. You know, a lot of like you get down into shame and things like that that are, feel super personal. This is quite impersonal. It's more like the way the world actually looks, like the, the visual experience. Um, you could also say it's psychedelic in nature in the sense that a lot of times when people take psychedelic m drugs or psychedelics, um, uh, plant medicines and things, well, sometimes what they experience is exactly this, that they experience the non-duality, but it's an experience. And then they, they kind of come out of it and it's, it, it becomes a mystical experience to the intact ego, even if they tell themselves they had ego death. And it, it's a really fascinating thing because you can have very, very pronounced mystical experiences but their experiences, they're not realization. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a fundamental shift that will occur at some point. And then we investigate, this gets into really subtle stuff, but we investigate the nature of form itself, whether there is any form at all, objects and, and so forth. And when that dissolves, uh, it's, it's this radical intimacy. There's not separation anywhere. There's also not really form anywhere, but there's also, it's not that there's a lack of form. It's not nothing. It's not nothingness. It's not like the way the mind would interpret it as like you've lost everything. Um, it's more like just seeing the fundamental illusion of separation never actually existed at all. Um, and that is often quite liberating. I don't know if I would call it liberation just yet, <laughs> but it, it's 99% of it. Now, the funny thing is that next 1%, can be quite dramatic for people. Um, it's something I don't talk about super often and I do it carefully because it's very hard to interpret early on, but it's kind of the, it's sort of the end of any ability to start to reconstruct a separate self anymore. It just kind of goes away because you see there was just nowhere for it to hide in the first place. When there's not separation, there's not form, um, there's no nothing reacting to anything. There's just nowhere for a self to hide anymore. So that's that's what I would call the the se true cessation, and to put it in Buddhist terms, um, it's a feeling of it's very interesting to watch. I've seen actually a handful of people who have gone through it recently, um, and it's a very interesting process. It can come with a lot of grief, but it doesn't always. Um, it's 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 very obvious that something quite fundamental has shifted and can't go back. Um, it, it becomes exquisitely paradoxical. Everything is very paradoxical because there's a there's a an undeniable joy and, a, and a, an exuberance that comes, but it's not from you, and it's not because you gain, gain something. It's not because you've attained anything. It has nothing to do with you. The you is over. The the you spiritual journey is gone, and now it's just like life appearing as it is. It's mm -hmm. it's quite beautiful. Dogen has this term for it: um, total exertion where it's just that light is just coming out of nowhere. It's coming into being as the entire universe as just that light. And there's no, there's nothing apart from it aware of it. It's just what is. And so that beautiful. Thing, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and that's, and you realize this is actually it. Like it's not a landing place either. It, it's, it's completely indescribable, but, um, but I will tell you in my experience of being around somebody who goes through this, and seeing people who sh after before and after this shift, even though it's a it's a insight by insight, it's a reasonably small thing. Um, it makes a huge difference in the way they express truth, the Dharma, or just the way they move through the world. It's mm -hmm. it, what I feel from from them is something like a combination of Buddhist emptiness, which is shunyata, and unconditional love. Mm -hmm. You can never unconditionally love as long as there's a piece of you there. Because you'll, mm. it'll, some part of it will always come back to the self. We'll always come back to the separate me. We'll always come back to the self. It's just how we're wired. It's not spiritual. It's not a doctrinal thing. It's it's human, you know. Um, and yeah, I, so I would I would just say that that's been my experience, and I would call that liberation. Liberation from the the illusion that can cause the illusion of separate self that can cause suffering, and all of the implications of that, which are reactivity and so, and then it turns into everything greed selfishness, personal suffering, repressed personal suffering, repressed personal suffering, turning into causing others to suffer and not even knowing it and on and on and on and on. And then group suffering, which can become extremely destructive, right? Um, we see it historically, you know, there are mm -hmm. times and places where groups of otherwise ordinary people turned into terrible, you know, did terrible things. And you go, how does that happen? 
Well, I know how it happens. <laughs> it happens because of, we carry around the potential to go deeply unconscious, uh, usually in fearful situations. Um, and that's what this work is really about, in my opinion. And, and it's, that's kind of putting a Buddhist spin on it, but I really believe that's what I find to be true. That's beautifully said. Yeah. So there you go. That's everything in a nutshell. <laughs> and I was going to ask, what is the realization of no self? So, oh, well, so here's the thing. People do talk about this very differently. And there's, I think there's a good amount of confusion, but what I, what I just described is the end of the, the ability to sort of, um, um, perceive yourself as anything separate from anything at all ever that would be what i would call true no self-realization um adi shanti makes a nice distinction here he calls it the death of the self and he makes the distinction between the death of the ego and the death of the self the death of the self is a very very fundamental movement um it's uh it's not something you can want it's not wantable because how could you want it all you can do is want want it for what you think it's going to do for you yet as you move through realization it starts to become obvious that that's that's where this goes and that it, you sense it now you can have very tr real tastes of no self early on. In fact, the in Bo the Buddhist model, in the first fetter is real is like realizing there's no separate self. It's 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 getting the the obvious knowing of that through experiential insight. Like, oh yeah, I I looked and it was not there. That was really obvious. Like there's you you just know there's not some separate self in here somewhere. But up until that point, you can be convinced of it, you know, for quite some time. <laughs> um, so, so I would say no self on a spectrum would, would, and it's a very, very broad spectrum. One is believing in no self. And I have to be a little careful with this sometimes because I've actually had conversations with people who have said, like, I believe there's no self and they've been online, they read about it and they understand Buddhism, but they have not even had an awakening. And it's, it's, <clears throat> which is fine. And I'm not being elitist. I'm saying, I've really did I've um I've caused people to be really disrupted like in their experience because I didn't realize that they had no insight, no no direct insight, and they did it was a belief for them. So you can believe in no self, like you can believe in anything. The ego can co-opt anything. It, it's mm -hmm. it's totally fine with this stuff, right? So there's certainly you can believe in it, understand it from a from a doctrine standpoint. It's one of the Dharma seals, like sure. Then at some point you may have a very real. Uh, at the level of realization, knowing of no self, of, there's no separate self, and that's completely obvious. Um, and yet, the sense of being a, uh, the sense of being the I am sense, let's call it, the the subtle sense of be of regrouping into a sense of self and inner world. There's still the components of self left, reactivity, like I described. Um, so I wouldn't call that full realization of no self, and I wouldn't call it liberation until until that. And speaking upon the ego. Um, does it become stronger through the shift and what can occur? You know, the ego for me is like a, um, a teach, a teaching tool or a, a pedagogical thing. It's not a real, a real thing. It's not like you're going to find something in there called the ego and try to eradicate it. Like there's this little homunculus you have to get rid of, and, you know, feel better. So I try not to overemphasize the, the term ego and the terminology, but it is convenient and damn well feels like there's something in there called an ego, uh, in in us certainly before awakening, like some something in there. It's like, what is it doing this? What's creating this illusion? Um, so, I would say, depending on how you define it, uh, the the ego. A lot of times, I'll say the ego kind of takes a critical hit with awakening, but it's not dead. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. kind of dragging. It's kind of dragging. It's it dragging its leg, and it moves off into the periphery, and you think it's dead, but it comes back with fire. So, one way of saying it is, the ego does not take awakening lying down <laughs> and when 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 it comes back with fire is when you start doing the reactivity work and you the shadow work and all that stuff um but again that at that point you don't need to personify it anymore you just know that there's work to do and you start doing the work uh so beyond that i don't think that the paradigm of ego really helps much and i don't talk about it much it's more like let's just get the work done mm -hmm. um let's do what there is to do let's see what there is to see um or you know make sure we're not repressing feeling what there is to feel, you know, doing all the things. Um, but to, to at that point, it's, it's usually to the practitioner or to the person going through this. It's not, they're not like holding on to some paradigm of ego anymore. They just know like, yeah, there's processes going on and conditions will uh, suddenly appear where there's reactivity. And then all of a sudden there's just flow again. And then there's peace and, you know, it can last for days, weeks, months, peace, flow, presence. And then all of a sudden repressed material. So you start to learn that there's that 
seesaw thing that happens that up and down or meing and being that's also part of that post awakening process at that stage it's like to reify the ego or to personify it doesn't make much sense anymore and interactions with others as we're going through the shift we Mm -hmm. our relationships can come and go what Mm -hmm. would you say on that and when do you know it is time to let something go (laughs) <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge question, right? <laughs> it's an important one. So um, relationships are an interesting part of this. To back up, I'll tell you something interesting that I learned over, a lo- it took me a long time to really see this. Um, if you were to ask from like the, the common human connota- uh, common human collective belief about enlightenment, let's say spiritual enlightenment, I think that the average person would believe that Something like having better relationships, being better around people, having less social anxiety, you'd think that would kind of come early, right? It really doesn't. It comes actually quite late in the process. (laughs) So it's one of the later things to where you really start to feel equanimity and close relationships uh, often. And it's because when we're in an emotionally connected situation with someone, the the physiology just, it, it just takes over in at the emotion level right? The persona is a little bit easier to manage, right? Because you can manage how much time you're around different people and you don't have fear of abandonment around like coworkers usually and things. You might, but most people don't. Um, So it's easier to manage and hold that persona aspect of yourself at a distance. But when you get to in the emotionally connected situations, you, you can't, you can't do that. You can't manage it so much. It's, you feel it and you react to it. And so, um, so after awakening, that that problem is not solved, uh, although you have vastly more access to it. Uh, the problem of myself and others, the problem of the fear of abandonment, the fear of intimacy, all the things that come with being an emotionally connected human being, uh, they're deeply rooted. And, and so they start to soften quite a bit, first of all, when we're willing to do the shadow work, and second of all, when we actually actually start really working on it and getting deep. That's when I think that softens a lot. Um, the, the reactivity around loved ones and all that sort of thing. Um, but it can last quite a while and it can surprise you. And sometimes you have to be put in certain situations that trigger it that you weren't in before, like a situation that causes jealousy, a situation that causes whatever anger, all of the different things. So, um, life is quite ingenious about that. I find that it does tend to put you in different situations and relationships to get exposure to these things we need to feel and process. But isn't Um, it also like a reflection of, of, of ourselves as well? different yeah. relationships we have in our lives they f- certainly can be yeah and um I, I i they can be and and what i i would say hold that lightly for this reason that um it, it's usually not a great idea to like try to use relationships to wake up or to continue the process because it's really your process mm-hmm. and what happens is if we try to like we impose we already impose too much on relationships as it is we impose too many expectations on our partner often um, and now if you impose a whole other set of expectations, <laughs> they're supposed to either wake up themselves or help you wake up or be your mirror or something. They don't know what that means, or they may not be up for that or whatever. So uh, hold that lightly, but it, yeah, absolutely. Every, relationships and closely emotionally connected situations are definitely mirrors. And if you see it that way, but don't put the responsibility impetus on the person you're connected to, but on yourself and go, okay, what is this showing me in myself? Wow. You know? Um, and a really important one in relationship is to get familiar with blame, see how it fu- functions inside you and be willing to become aware of it when it shows up and see that that's what's actually happening. Oh, blame is here. Oh, I see. I'm blaming my partner because I don't feel pe- at peace right now. And I'm sure it's their fault, right? Wait a minute. That's a belief. That's a thought. Oh, blame is here. <laughs> oh, okay. Blame is here. Okay. That's what's happening. Right. Um, so that, that's a, that's a really good one to just start to disentangle um, uh, our enmeshment with the, with the, the pattern of the person we're connected to and a pattern, meaning what I mean by that is when we're doing this, when we're, re- when we're enmeshed, when we're reactive, we're actually not seeing that person. And they, at some level, they know we're not seeing them. We're seeing our beliefs about how they should be, who they should be. And that comes from our own families usually and things like that. So that's an important thing to see like, okay, am I actually seeing that person really for who they are? Or am I seeing what I want them to be and what I think they need to be and how they need to make me comfortable and all that? Like, do, do they need all, do they need to do all that? And, and how would it feel for me if someone was expecting me to do all that for them? And I didn't even know it. Right. Um, there's another way, right. Love meta, you know, to see that person for who they are and realize like, 
they're a human being and they have free will and they have their own insights and their own instincts. And I'm not here to control them. I'm not here to manipulate their view of me or anything else, you know, and you can just start to actually enjoy somebody and just enjoy human, you know, connection, but not have expectations or needs that, especially that are uncommunicated to that person. So all that starts to soften up and it, it really with equanimity, I think it, it gets very simple. doesn't mean there will never be challenges in relationships, but it becomes very obvious where the boundaries are is for me it was so it, it's like you can see w when something is their responsibility and when it's your responsibility and it's not that hard to figure out um it can be intense emotionally and, and it may be just because you could be in, interacting with someone who has a, a very intense repressed experience or something there's no way you can't feel that and it takes a lot of discernment on your own part before you stop blaming them for that because it's not their, they're just feeling what they're feeling or not feeling what they're feeling, but we're empathic mammal, mammalian beings. We're going to feel what our people are close to us feel. And there's no way around it. Um, and, and that that's an acceptance that is really important with this. If you're going to be close to somebody, especially when you're waking up more and more, you have that, you have to take on that responsibility. Like, you know, because people can become weird and manipulative too with this. You, you have, you have awakening, you, you start to see you actually have influence on people. You you affect people a lot and people come to you for help and stuff like that. And that's great. It, but if you're in an emotionally connected situation, you could become blinded somewhat or you could not see, you could have your own dark spots or your own shadow you're not seeing in that. Uh, and then in unhealthy ways, become manipulative of your partner. And in, on, a, on a broader scale, this is when people turn into cult leaders. And as crazy as cult leader sounds, there are cult leaders that are, uh, that are out there right now, <laughs> and they're mm -hmm. some are very popular. So, and that and they what they do is they have that enmeshed, you know, manipulative in, uh, relationship, but with a larger group, like an mm -hmm. inner circle, or even their whole group or whatever. But it's the same dynamic. It's rooted in the fear of uh, abandonment and just not seeing clearly and having some discernment, so you can see other people's stuff, sure, but you can't see your own kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, just being clear, like my work is my work to do and i want to take responsibility full responsibility for everything i feel and everything i believe and not have undue expectations for my partner or anyone i'm close to or anyone for that matter because they have a right to be who they are period so beautifully said what advice would you give our listeners in reference to med meditation and where should they begin sure yeah I, for meditation um it's a great question. I, I really try to point people to their own instincts because I don't like to say this is the right kind of meditation, this is the right kind of practice, etc. Try some different things. What I will say about meditation, a few pointers about it. Um, one is, you know, try a few things, and if you just don't find something that really clicks for you, um, then consider doing something like. Um, well, first of all, I have an app where I do a lot of guided meditations. That's free. It's called uh, Simply Awake, um, and Find someone who can guide you into meditation, uh, not necessarily learning a technique, but to learn the feel of it. So that's what I try to do with my guided meditations. There's there's plenty on Adya Shanti has guided meditations online. Uh, I'm sure Sam Harris, I've never used his app, but I'm sure he has some good stuff on there. Find someone uh, who can guide you into the actual feeling of meditation so that you get familiar with it. It's an instinctual thing. Once you get a sense of what the meditative experience or meditative state is like, that's great. Then you can explore different techniques to see which ones work for you to get to that. Um, I, in my book, I have a chapter on meditation where I kind of describe different techniques. And there's one that's interesting in that some people early on really get it and other people really don't until later. And that's natural meditation or um, uh, like shikantaza would be the Zen term. It's, it's basically not doing anything. It's a meditation of not engaging anything, not pushing on anything, not pulling on anything, not trying to cause anything to happen, not trying to manage anything. It's a, it's a meditation of what you're not doing because all day long, that's what we are doing or we feel like we're doing. So you just disengage from all of it and you just put away distractions. Now, some people, it really works for them. You know, um, I might say something like turn toward your inner instinct. That's wordless. That's always been there. And that's it. Don't, don't try to solve anything. Just go there. Just go where your instinct wants to take you. And people who move m more in the feminine definitely do this, what, usually do this more, more easily. Um, but it, it's interesting because at some point in this process, for pretty much everyone, it, it, it clicks at some point what, what this actually means, natural meditation. It's a, it's a natural meditative state that's actually always here. Quite fascinating. 
So you, you realize, oh, I don't have to do anything to cause it. It's already there. It already is. So natural meditation can be good if you know if, if you click with it or resonate with it. Um, if not, you know, try mantra meditation, try breath based meditation. Um, and then the other thing I would suggest is if if all that, you know, you just can't build a practice or you don't resonate with meditation, that's still okay. Um, but one thing you can try is go to a meditation retreat, you know, tr do a three day retreat somewhere that's largely meditation based. Just see and see how that feels. Sometimes the sustained meditation environment will will help something click in for you. It could just be that you're you're at your house and you're by yourself and you you you're convinced that I can't sit still that long and that that overriding belief makes it very hard to like learn any meditation techniques and you just don't get it. But when you sit in a group of people and everyone's sitting still and you can get that group can push you through your restlessness and then you realize oh I can actually sit still, then then you might drop into some some meditative states. So Meditation retreats can be very helpful as well. And there are online ones that, that you can do. So those are the things I would do. Now, if all if you do all of that and still something and he's like, I don't like to meditate, don't worry about it. You don't need to meditate to wake up. I know people who woke up who didn't meditate. So um, I, I would say if I could tell you a practice that is the most direct for waking up, it would be inquiry, specifically self-inquiry initially or some version of it. But I don't think we have time to unpack that necessarily, but my whole chapter on it goes into what I really mean by that. It's not just asking an intellectual question. It's what comes with it, what comes before it, how you ask, and then what you do after. All that has to be in place for inquiry to really do what it's going to do. And it's very, very powerful. Angelo, can you lead us into a meditation? Sure. Absolutely. How much time do you want to I would to say 10, up? 15 minutes. Okay. Perfect. You... I can do that. Wonderful. Great. Okay, cool. <clears throat> So um, for meditation, uh, this, this, since I brought it up, I'll, I'll talk about, um, I'll do sort of a guided meditation about natural meditation. Um, so when I talk about meditation, I usually try to remind people that I'm not trying to teach you anything that you need to remember. I'm not going to give you some magical technique that you just absolutely have to remember. So, so then you can let your, your mind calm down. There's nothing to, to quote unquote get here. Um, and so we can just let our minds chill out a little bit. Um, the other thing I want to say is I, I'm not, um, championing any specific technique, whatever meditative technique you use, that's totally fine. If you don't use one, that's also fine. This is really just to give you a taste of it, get, give you a sense and drop you into what a natural meditative state feels like. So that's the overall context. Now, um, you know, sit in a comfortable position. You, you can you know, sit upright in a, Zen posture, you can sit reclining on a couch or chair. Um, and some people even lay down, but uh, I would just say if you if you fall asleep easily laying down, maybe try to try it sitting up. Um, requires a little bit of alertness. Really, that's all you need to bring to this is some alertness. Uh, close your eyes if it feels natural. You can also do it with your eyes open, and some people do. So uh, as we begin, we're just going to Kind of take inventory, just look around with the mind's eye in a sense. You know, what's, what's going on in the sound field? Not judging anything. We're not labeling anything. We're just sort of taking inventory and letting the sounds in. We can let them in all at once. We can notice one sound here and one sound there. There's no rules to how this will play out. And just sort of let the sounds present themselves completely naturally. We might notice also the sensations in the body. Wherever your attention is called, it might be in the hands. It might be the breath. You might feel coolness somewhere in your feet or hands. Or even warmth. Or tingles. So whatever we feel and wherever we feel it, we're just going to notice how it's already there. It's not a state we cultivate. It's just simply already there. The sensations don't need our help. You might even notice the sensations may feel sort of inside and outside the body. It, they may not. 
and there's no right or wrong about this, but often it feels something like a bit of a sense cloud, just like some unknown number of points of sensation, the hands, the legs, the chest, the face. And if we don't impose a mental image of the body or body parts uh, and just allow that sensation cloud to present itself, we might just sort of feel a loosening of our experience. There's no goal here. As we notice these sensations, we're not trying to make them do anything. We're not trying to look for a pattern. We're not taking notes for later. We're not analyzing anything at all. Just feeling. We may notice that the attention can accommodate the sensations or the sensation cloud of the body. And even sound or the sound field at the same time. If this is not the case, that's okay. A thought might pop up saying, I can't do that. How do I do that? We just notice those are thoughts. Similar to the sensations in the body, thoughts are made of a sort of sensory substance or cloud. We might notice how the thoughts move, the formation of a thought. Kind of starts from nowhere, forms into some sort of mental image or even a narrative or our own voice. Kind of fades. Doesn't really have a specific location, but we have some awareness of it for sure. And we realize that thought is no problem. The space in which a thought occurs or is noticed is the same space in which sensations of the body are noticed. And it's the same space in which sound is noticed. So the space or the noticing and the sensations are one and the same. The space or the noticing and the sound which is noticed, heard, are one and the same, intermingling. And even this we don't have to take notes about. We might notice a response or a reaction internally that says, cool, or Wow, I have to remember this. Again, it's just the substance of thought flowing through. Not apart from anything. Not apart from the thinking substance. Not apart from the conscious substance. Not apart from you. We notice this sort of accommodation or not apartness. It can be found everywhere. It can be found in the sensations in our body, in our chest, in our shoulders. Not apartness. Pure accommodation for experience it can be found in our head sensations in our scalp, 
accommodation, not apartness. Can be found floating in the environment around our head. Inside and outside, this not apartness, full accommodation of experience. So here is rest. It's not a rest that we have to do. It's always at rest. It's not the kind of rest that's in contrast to activity because activity is accommodated here as well. This is accommodation that knows no limitation, knows no boundary, has no beginning or end, has no specific purpose or need in this moment other than just being. And this is our birthright in that we've never been apart. The access is always here. And you're welcome to acknowledge this at any time, even if you only have a few moments throughout the day. Just touch in and it's already there. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if there is one word for the collective, what would that be? Oh, did I disappear? Sorry. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Um, one word for the collective. Let me try it. It may or may not work. Let's see here. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> Phone did something funny there. Uh, one word for the collective. Love. And can you expand on that? <laughs> well, unconditional love. I was going to say I had to break it down to one word, but unconditional love, meaning this love is so um, all-encompassing, so potent. Uh, it will surprise you. It will surprise you. It, it, it doesn't, it's not limited by any limitation in the way we perceive what love should be, what we think we need, even what we think life and death is about. In, in Buddhism, they have this wonderful term um, or this phrase of like solving the problem of birth and death, right? So grandiose. But that this is the problem of birth and death, you know? Um, and there is a solution and the solution ultimately is is a love that goes beyond the human dimension goes beyond form, goes beyond emptiness. It's um, in the individual sense at the beginning of all of this, it's a love that it's a love of truth, a love of living truth, though, not a set of principles, not a, not a certain paradigm or orientation, but living truth and the, the trust that, that there is a depth that we can plumb that's endless um and in 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 this in this unfolding of truth and awakening and being willing to go there that's that's the guiding that's the guiding orientation with love and it will show you over time what unconditional love actually is angela where may our, now i can't speak <laughs> where may our listeners find you okay so i have a uh, channel um on youtube called simply always awake and it's fantastic oh thank you <laughs> Um, and I have a, a, a website, if you want to look for retreats and stuff, it's called simplyalwaysawake.com. And that's all one word, simplyalwaysawake.com. And there's like retreats, announcements and stuff there. That's essentially it. The book is called Awake. It's your turn on Amazon. And I do have that free app called Simply Awake. And there's many guided meditations that are, if you like the one we just did, it's like that. So, Any last words? Um, I wish everyone fruition. Uh, I do want to say, you know, this a lot of this is about timing. If you hear this and it feels 
like, oh, this isn't the right time for me, or this is too deep or too intense or something. That's fine. Put it on the shelf. Like, you know, live your life and, and enjoy your life and try to live out of authenticity. You may be surprised later when it like taps you on the shoulder. So, um, so this is possible for anyone for sure, but it doesn't mean that everyone has to do it or it's like, you have to do it right now, or it's not about that kind of prioritization. It's more about your own instinct and when, when it's time to start just going inward. Well, thank you, Angelo. And I wanted to end by saying a few words that I heard you say on an episode. And that is, and this is for my audience, mm -hmm. there is a way out of suffering and that is within. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it.